so now David Garcia with yeah I'm here <laughs> perfect okay so David Garcia learning from anarchist observation similarities between science and religion please uh, thanks so much, Nicole. I'm having experiencing problems with internet the, the, the whole afternoon, so I'm sorry for that. Um, so if my connection follows, you already know what's happening. Um, <clears throat> well, and I'm sorry because of that, exactly because of that, I won't be able to show the, the beautiful slides that I made for all of you, but I can, I can attach the slide afterwards, uh, uh, sent to you by email, of course. Uh, and you can share with everyone if it's the case. Well, uh, I'm talking, I will talk about learning from an artistic observation, similarity between science and religion, right? And the first question that arises in everyone's mind is uh, what uh, sci science actually share similarity with religion? And what kinds uh, of similarities, right? What, what, what kind of uh, things they both can share, right? Um, it, are these things good or bad things, all right? Uh, so we will explore how Fire Habit uh, answers these questions from an anarchist, from an, an epistemic perspective, right? Um, so first of all, uh, it, it's, it's important to highlight that uh, science and religion when I use the term science or when I use the term religion, um, I'm talking in a didactic terminology, which means that they are inexistent entities. We all know that there is no such a thing as, as science. We know that there is sciences and we all know that there is no such a thing as one religion, right? We know that there is many religions. So when I'm talking about religion or science, it's just... Uh, based on, on didactic uh, purposes. So when we mention this term, that, that's, the, that's the, the, the purpose. Well, uh, after that, we can start exploring that science and religion uh, this declaratively desire progress in human flourishing, right? This is, this is a common um, assumption among scientists and religious people. Also, among these people, declaratively, we know that they desire to be tolerant uh, to, to worldviews, towards worldviews, right? Um, but this, this, let's say, good similarity, similarities between science and religion stops right there. So um, I'm going to start to explore some similarities between science and religion that will not be pleased, neither scientists, not religious people. First of all, um, let's address the question of truth, right? The, the nature of truth, the definition of truth, the methodology of truth. So what, when we, we explore truth in religions uh, fields or in scientific fields, what we uh, actually uh, is trying to do what we, we are, what we are trying to do right so uh, however when science approaches uh questions like truth um there is two forms to do that we can scientists explore that under a pluralist account or under a, moni a monist account right and, and the, it is easy to see that under a monolithic account or a monist account uh, how it can be, how science can be closer to religion in the way that science approach truth. I, it asked, uh, I mean, when science, with some perspective uh, of science, try to define uh, reality under, under one, um, let's say, ontology. So, uh, based, based on that, we can, for instance, take some scientists that took this approach uh, uh, and considered to be the, the, the best one, the, that's considered to be the most defining um, 
and better definition of, of, of world and reality. And which, of course, it's based on their theories and their perspective and, 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 and on worldview. So, for instance, Galileo, in, when he was criticized, uh, he then uh, wrote in the, in the two maximum systems of, of the Ptolemy and, and Copernican world, he said, when he said this, these words, uh, and I quote, with all the proofs in the world that would that would you expect to accomplish in the minds of people who are too stupid to recognize their own limitations. So Galileo is, is ob obviously criticizing that uh, uh, anyone who didn't recognize uh, uh, the heliocentric uh, approach would be stupid. Uh, a little bit after that, um, in December 1860, uh, in a letter to, to Moray, Darwin said about his third third edition of Origin. Well, everyone knows that he wrote uh, six editions, right? He basically changed almost 50% of the book from the first to the last um, to the last version edition. And in the third edition of the origin, and he said, I hope never again have to, uh, uh, to make so many corrections or rather additions, which I have made in hopes of making my many rather stupid reviewers at least understand what it's meant, right? So Darwin, again, like Galileo was calling everyone who was, who were reviewing uh, his his work stupid. So based based on this kind of of, of perspective or a way to address scientific issues, uh, um, uh, Feyerabend described the situation, the similarity sometimes that that occur between science and religion in this way. Um, Feyerabend said. Uh, that those who want to improve knowledge um, but hardly take their own views as absurd will find themselves behaving, and I highlight this, religiously, presenting their view as being, and I quote, the truth, everything else is error, and those who know it, understand it, but still reject it, are rotten to the core or hopeless idiots, right? He said that in the against, in against methods. Um, so the major problem for Feyerabend, for Feyerabend is not, it's not that anyone can argue in favor of, of uh, his own perspective. The problem is when you address your own perspective as being the truth, right? And, and sometimes um, scientists do that. And sometimes religious, uh, some religious peoples do that as well. So when this kind of thing occur, uh, Feyerabend believes that science gets closer to religion in a way that really scientists didn't want to, uh, at least not as uh, as they they uh, like to present science, right? Right? As a as a tolerant area, as a as a very open-minded area. Um, so then, uh, Feyerabend implies that one of the most important value of science is pluralism and divergence, followed by criticism, of course. So uh, he claims that unanimous agreements may be fitting for a rigid church, but not for science, since pluralism is and I quote, it's necessary for objective knowledge, end of quote. Is, this is against, in against method as well. So from this perspective of pluralism, um, uh, so from this perspective, pluralism is also an epistemic value for progress of knowledge. But I have been reminded that sometimes religion can be more open to, can be more open to science than um, 
then they 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 first would like to 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 think of right so um because of that um what happened in in a in a in a uh, in a paper called classic classical empiricism he described one very very interesting rule of protestantism and how this rule of protestantism is related with three let's say rules of the post galilean science which he calls classical science right so he he's what he says um he says well the protestant the protestant rule and i quote luther and calvin declare the holy scripture to be the foundation of the of all religion so um the idea is that uh the holy scripture would be the the epistemic foundational basis for for protestant uh, knowledge for religious uh, knowledge and then he goes on and he's and, sorry and then uh, he uh Martin Luther, Martin Luther said in a in a book uh, 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 quoted by Bentinson and Mauder, he Martin Luther said, "For what is asserted without the authority of the Scripture and of proven revelation may be held as an opinion." So there is there there are no obligation to believe in it if there is no basis on the Scripture. So the scripture is indeed a basis for uh, religious knowledge um, 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 in, under this Protestant rule, right? So then Feyerabend takes this and he compares it with uh, three rules of science, at least when science uses uh, uh, experience, how science uses experience in a post galilean science well the fir first rule is this classical science is critical right and there is never a complete stability okay everyone accepts that but two critical and progressive uh, critical or progressive and dogmatic or conservative go hand in hand but all theories rest on one stable foundation in a post galilean science which is experience right so in a post galilean science experience especially if you think um, uh, after the creation of, of of the royal society where we can observe at least four uh, branches of uh, ways to deal with uh, empiricism which is the the, the so called crude empiricism the hook empiricism, the Baconian empiricism, and then finally the Newtonian empiricism. So, based on this uh, way to address this uh, experience, right? So, science believe, uh, takes experience as the, the 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 stable foundation, right? The 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 the, the basis for an independent evaluation of theories. And then it go, he goes, he, he, it goes the, the third rule, which is this abysm between critical ideology and the stable foundation. It's bridged by first experience as self-evident, right? So um, that's one uh, thing. I'm, I'm finished. I'm going, I'm going to the, I'm, I mean, I'm towards the end. Uh, and two, experience is solidified by by success of the hypothesis it illustrates. And third, and third, it is given the appearance of stability. So, just like uh, the, the the scripture is the basis for all religious knowledge in Protestantism, experience became uh, a, a basis. Uh, lex let's say, uh, outside of any criticism for a post galilean science as well. So this kind of similarity, of course, that neither scientists or, or nor uh, religious people will be, will be pleased with my 
my perspective here, but the idea is that sometimes when scientists do that, when they use experience in this way, they are um, embracing a, a monistic approach of, uh, of, of, of science from uh, a, a, a seemingly op or, or supposedly uh, stable uh, and independent uh, uh, basis for our theories, which is experience. So to conclude, Bayer Arben claims that science and religions and religious religions sorry share some epistemic values. We, in addition, claim that such similarities is still uh, something to look at it once the dispute between a monist and a pluralist account of science is alive and well. So uh, that's basically it. Um, I really appreciate your attention and, and the audience. Um, and I'm sorry for not being able to, to share the, 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 the slides with you. Thanks so much. Thanks, David. Uh, so, any, uh, any questions? Uh, Nikolai, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay, good. I'll just I'll just say thank you very much for a um, very fine presentation. I also want to make sure you could hear me. Thank you very much. Yeah. David, any other question? I I didn't hear the question actually. I think it was more an. Uh, uh, I I can ask a I can ask a question. Um, this language that you find in Darwin and Galileo of calling their interlocutors uh, stupid, um, I I am sort of um, my attention is caught by that as a kind of device. And I wonder, um, do you think that in both cases there was a failure of charity? Uh, that is, not claiming so much that your interlocutors are mistaken as that they're stupid. Do you, you think that that's a failure of charity? Yeah, yeah, I, I see. I see a point. Well, first of all, I think that in the case of Darwin, we need to be, we need to be uh, uh, intellectually honest because Darwin actually is much, much, much more uh, uh, honest about his the, the limitation of his theory of his theory than Galileo. So, in many cases, uh, from 1830 until uh, 1860, 1861, 62, uh, Darwin called even himself uh, um, stupid or foolish. And so I think that he really intended to call his, his reviewers uh, stupid, but, but he also called himself many times stupid. So Darwin is much, much, much more, uh, let's say, he, he put himself in a more equal level than Galileo. In the case of Galileo, however, uh, he's not so... Um, kind with his reviewers as Darwin was. So Galileo actually was much more harder on them. And he really called it, uh, if you, when we read uh, the, the two uh, maximum system of the Copernican and, and, and Ptolemaic uh, world, it's clear that uh, Salviati, Salviati many times called his adversaries uh, or interlocutors stupid, um, rotten to the core, as Feyerabend put it, right? So um, that's so the, the, the real point here is that uh, it's less about the, 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 the colorful names, the colorful language that they use, and much more about uh, the, the 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 adoption uh, of uh, of a monist uh, monist uh, uh, approach and, uh, of of his own theory, and I should I should underline also that Galileo is is 
is is Fire Abent's hero, right? Uh, Galileo is is everyone is, is the guy that Fire Abent uses as a model uh, of, of of how a scientist should should uh, proceed. But he also made a lot of criticism against Galileo, right? Uh, so so just to be more uh, straight about straightforward to go more to be more direct about your uh, your question. No, these names are not interchangeable by other names. Let's let's say less offensive names. But I think that in the case of Darwin, things are not so serious as it, as it is in the case of Galileo. Thank you very Thanks much. So Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Question. So, I think someone has the microphone open. So, this again, David, if there are uh, someone has the microphone open, maybe it's mine. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yep. Okay, so thanks, David. Uh, I think it's time. If there are no more questions, I think it's time for all.